Welcome to this week's episode of Danny's Russia. I wanted to share an idea that I read on Shavuos by Rabbi Yisachar Friend that deeply resonated with me that I had to just share with you. And he asked a question, which is, it's well known that before the Jewish people left Egypt, they were on the 49th and lowest level of Tuma. They were on the lowest level of ritual impurity. And if they would have remained there for even a moment longer, they would have reached the point of no return. They were on such a low le- level that before crossing the Red Sea, the angels protested, wondering how the Jews, who were Obde Avodah Zarah, were idol worshippers, should be spared when they're no different than the Egyptians, who were also Ovde Avodah Zarah, idol worshippers. There was this like equivalence with them, like they were on the same spiritual plane in that they were both idol worshippers. But remarkably, somehow, some way, 50 days later, they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai as God revealed himself to the entire nation and gave them the Torah. How was such a seven-week transformation possible from the lowest low to the highest high? And Rabbi Friend answers this question by contrasting two different Gemaras. The Gemara in Yuma, Daf Yud Ches Amid Aleph, recalls how a wealthy widow named Marta Bazbaitos paid a whole lot of money to Yanai Hamelech, to King Yanai, in order to appoint her husband, her new husband, Yoshua ben Gamla, to be the Kohen Gadol. And we see that in the days of the Second Temple, where there was a lot of corruption, what emerges is that this lofty position of Kohen Gadol could literally be bought for the right amount of money. And after a first glance at this, at, at a qu- after a quick glance from this Gemara, it would appear that Rabbi Yeshua ben Gamla is somewhat of a fraud of a Kohen Gadol, who only received his position due to a bribe. And yet, the Gemara in Bava Basra, a very beautiful Gemara, paints an entirely different picture about Rabbi Yeshua ben Gamla, because the Gemara there says. That Rav Yehuda says in the name of Rav, I'm Daf Daf Chaf Aleph Amid Aleph. It says Baram Zachor Oso Ha'ish Latov. However, there, there's a there's a man that we have to remember for the good, the Yeshua Ben Gamla Shmoy. And his name is Rav Yeshua Ben Gamla. She Omalehu Nistakach Torah Misrael. If not for him, the Torah would be forgotten from the Jewish people. How so? So the Gemara tells us. Somebody had a father, his father would teach him Torah. If someone was not blessed with a father, he would not teach him Torah. He wouldn't learn Torah. And then the more continues, so what happened? They enacted that they should start teaching children in Jerusalem. But still, it was still a problem because someone had a father. His father would bring him up to Jerusalem where he would learn Torah. If someone didn't have a father, he wouldn't go up and he wouldn't go learn. And then eventually the Gemara says, Then they would set up shop in each and every region throughout the land. And they would bring students who are 16 or 17 years old to learn Torah. If the Rebbe got upset, if the rabbi got mad and upset, he would just get up and leave. Until Rabbi Yeshua ben Gamla got up and he enacted he enacted that there should be teachers of children in every single state in every single city they would bring him there when they were six or seven years old. What emerges from this incredible Gemara is that Rabbi Shoban Gamla was the one who established the day school system where Jewish children of all ages had access to learn Torah and to become the next link in the chain of transmission of our Torah. What emerges is that he was a remarkable person from this Gemara. So, what gives? Was he a fraud? Or was he a tzaddik? Was he a righteous person? And Rabbi Fran quotes the Sfas Emes, who explains 
that yes, indeed, the Bishop and Gamla did achieve his status through rather unscrupulous means. But the job ultimately led to a metamorphosis of his entire persona. Because once he became the Kohen Gadol, people started treating him like a Kohen Gadol. They started honoring like a Kohen Gadol. And therefore he was transformed and he began feeling like a Kohen Gadol as well. Because people respond to the way that other people treat them. With this understanding, the Svas Emes shares with us an incredible insight about psychology that can answer our first question. How did the Jewish people, the idol-worshipping idol slaves that they were, emerge from the 49th level of Tuma to receive the Torah 50 days later? Rabbi Fran points to a Pusik in Sefer Shmos right before we received the Torah, which says famously and beautifully, You should be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God instructs Moshe to share with the Jewish people that what he thought of them, that despite everything that you've done, and as low as you have fallen, you are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In this moment, they transformed from Ovde Avodazara, from idol worshippers, to a Goy Kadosh, a holy nation. The Almighty believed in us, so we in turn were able to believe in ourselves. Such is human nature. We rise or fall to the level of faith that others have in us. What a powerful lesson this is for all of us. For those of us with children, our children's behavior will reflect how we treat them. If we treat them as immature and incapable, their behavior will reflect this. If we show them we admire them and we believe in them and we have hope and aspirations for them, they will live up to this expectation as well. As Rabbi Fran describes, when a child acts up, we can ask, how could he have done that? But so much is expressed in which word we emphasize. Do we say, how could you have done that? You who are so holy, you who are so incredible and amazing, how could you do this thing that's so beneath you? Or we could ask, how could you have done that? Have you sunk so low and so deep that you actually did that? Our duty as parents is to ensure that our children see themselves as the mamleches koanim, as part of this mamleches koanim that Hashem sees in us. My father and I coach my 11-year-old's baseball team, and sometimes the boys have a hard time catching the ball, which makes it hard to win games. And we debate, should we treat them like they know how to catch the ball, like they should know how to do this, like they're capable and able to do that? Or should we assume and treat them like they can't, like they're just starting? This is a dilemma we have. And this lesson applies not only in how we treat our children, but in how we treat everybody else as well. When I treat my wife like the royalty she is, she undoubtedly acts the part and treats me the exact same way. I remember the first morning when I was married, I figured, I just got married last night. I could dive in at home this morning. No need to get up early for shul. But when she saw me, looking very confused, she wondered aloud, why aren't you in shul right now? From then I realized that I need to live up to her lofty expectations of me. When I treat my employee like an extremely competent, vital asset of my business, he will perform, undoubtedly, to a very high level, making sure that my trust in him is not misplaced. Now, if I don't show trust, and belief to those around me. They will undoubtedly live down to my low expectations of them as well. God willing, we can heed this incredible lesson. We can have full clarity that we are memleches koinim v'goy kadosh. We can act the part and live up to our godly potential. Have a beautiful day and a beautiful week ahead.